Recording in progress. Did, did you send it? All right, we are now recording. If you did, if you didn't send it, yes, you need to send it. Um, you should be able to do it right on to the uh, to the form itself or into the discussion. If you open up the discussion, there should be a place to fill it out. Um, but yes, you you do need. You know, everybody needs to send it Friday is when it closes. So, uh, just need to get us in. Uh, the test, uh, the the module test, well, we're going to have a quiz on Chapter 9. So, you'll have that. It will close in 48 hours uh, after we get out of class today. And then, or at 10 o'clock is when it's supposed to open. Um, and then at 10 o'clock also, the module test will open. Uh, the module test will be open until it'll be open for 72 hours. I just told you what we were voting for. Good Lord, you were the one. You were the one. I sent it into the form thing. I didn't know if you could still see it uh, because you were logged out. Yeah, if I, if you did it, then um, I can definitely see it. If you did it, um, so what we did is uh, or the the poll question one through four. Uh, number three was the one we picked, and it was for a discussion. It would be for a discussion grade. So there were four scenarios that I had in mind uh, to put out there, or four discussions to put out there, and uh, I didn't know which one I wanted to do of the four, and y'all pick, y'all picked it for me. You picked your own punishment, which is awesome. So, uh, we will do that. And it goes along with patient assessment. So it'll be on the patient assessment dis uh, discussion. Chapter 10. But today, so tonight, Module 9 quiz will be opening, as well as uh, the, I'm sorry, Chapter 9 quiz will be opening as well as the module test will be opening. The module test can be found if you go to that sidebar and you see quizzes, you'll see module test there. You should be able to see it. It should also be in your calendar as well. Um, so it'll be open until uh, 72 hours later. So quizzes, 48 hours. Module test, 72 hours. It is a 50 question module test. You get 51 minutes to complete the module test. Now, uh, all the questions should look pretty familiar to you. And uh, if you studied, if you studied your past tests, they should look pretty familiar to you. You should be able to blow through quite a bit of them, saving yourself time. Awesome. That's what I'm talking about. All right, so today we'll be discussing um, lifespan development. This is Chapter 9 of our AEMT course installment. Uh, and we will rock and roll. So, uh, lifespan development. <clears throat> this applies a fundamental knowledge of lifespan development to patient assessment and management. So some of the EMS competencies and standard here. So we'll look through those. So it says AMTs must be aware of changes a person undergoes at various life stages. Uh, and it may, knowing you know what changes those are, it may alter your approach to patient care. As well, your uh, patient care includes the assessment, the treatment, and all that. All right, busting out. So starting off with neonates. Uh, neonates is birth to one month, and infants is one month to one year. Okay, so you're only you're you're only a neonate from birth to one month, one month, and then infants you're only an infant one month to one year. So. Uh, Neonate, uh, it says infants, uh, infants, children from one one month to one year, develop at a startling rate. That that is true, and we say it all the time. If you if you do have kids, they grow up way too fast. 
Uh, neonates, children from uh, birth to one month, uh, they will also be co covered. I'm sorry. <clears throat> they will also be covered in Chapter 35, uh, Obstetrics and Neonatal Care. So we'll have that coming up. 35. Way away. But we will cover them. So neonates and infants, vital signs. Uh, the younger the person, the faster the pulse rate and respirations. Uh, at birth, a pulse rate of 90 to 205 beats a minute and a respiratory rate of 30 to 60 breaths a minute are considered normal. Uh, within the first half hour after birth, the first half hour, a neonate's pulse often drops to 120 beats a minute and the respiratory rate falls to between 30 to 40 breaths a minute. Okay? By, by age one year, by the first year, the respiratory rate slows to 20 to 30 breaths per minute. The tidal volume uh, in neonates starts at 6 to 8 milligrams, um, I'm sorry, um, tidal volume milliliters per, per kg, not milligrams, mil per kg, okay? Uh, but increases to 10 to 15 mils per kg by the end of the first year, by the end of the first year. Uh, your blood pressure, or the blood pressure of those of those ankle biters, uh, directly corresponds to their weight. So it typically increases with age. Uh, so at birth, the average systolic blood pressure of a neonate is 67. So systolic's the top number, right? To, it's 67 to 84 millimeters of mercury. And uh, 85 to 100 millimeters of mercury by one year of age. A uh, neonate's body, normal body temperature, raises from 98 degrees Fahrenheit to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, while an infant's normal temperature ranges from 98, uh, or I'm sorry, 96.8 and 99.6. All right, talking about weight. A uh, neonate usually weighs 6 to 8 pounds, or 3 to 3.5 kgs at birth. I want y'all to start getting used to kgs, okay, kilograms, and getting weights. Because when you start, when you start figuring uh, drugs, when you start figuring uh, drip rates and all that kind of stuff, you're going to have to know the kgs, all right, or kilograms. <clears throat> the, uh, the head, the head on the neonate... Um, oh, I'm sorry, the head, <laughs> the head doubles and accounts for 25% of an infant's body weight. In the first week after birth, neonates lose 5% to 10% of their birth weight due to fluid loss alone. Uh, by week two, neonates grow at a rate at about one ounce per day. And then they, then doubling their weight by four to six months and tripling it by the end of the first year. Also, huh? Uh, the cardiovascular system, uh, at birth, the neonate makes the transition from fetal to independent circulation. Whoa. All right, continuing with uh, neonates and infants. Uh, the pulmonary system, neonates are primarily nose breathers, nose breathers. Uh, infants younger than six months are particularly prone to nasal congestion, which can lead to upper respiratory infections, or URI, okay? Um, and you have to ensure that the infant's nasal patches, passages are clear and obstructed by mucus. Uh, what do we keep in our bag for that? Do y'all remember? That's right, a bulb, <laughs> suction bulb. Okay, uh, or mom's always got a suction bulb, or should have a suction bulb. 
If not, there are ways to suction, but you just got to be careful when you're doing it. Use a soft tip or something like that, which may possibly be the way that you have to do it. But when you do, know your parameters of your suction. So an infant's rib cage is less rigid than an adult's, and the ribs sit horizontally, right? So they come out this way. All right. Uh, so also infants are belly breathers uh, because of accessory muscles are immature and fatigue sets in really quickly. So something else too, um, if you read your book, it mentioned it as well, and it made a really good point, is that whenever you're whenever you're ch doing the birth uh, or the birth rates, whenever you're doing the breaths per minute, you're checking to make sure you get that accurate number for breaths per minute. Um, on a infant, what are you looking at? Rather than looking at their chest, because it's not going to move as much, what are you going to look at and count? Does anybody remember from reading? Yep. You're going to look at their abdomen. That's right. Because of accessory muscle use, right? Also, accessory muscle use, you'll see that you know, in infants and kids, if they're using accessory muscle use due, and they're having respiratory distress, accessory muscle use, yes, does mean as uh, also their belly, seeing their belly go up and down. But what else will you see on an on a infant or child uh, that's uh, accessory muscle use? It's a term from your EMT that you should remember, and from pediatrics, during respiratory distress, you will see this. Starts with an R. R Come on. Let me see it. Anybody? Bueller? Retractions. The word I was looking for was retractions. I'm gonna get that. Uh, I'm gonna get that buzzer sound. That uh, that uh, what, what's that show? Jeopardy has. Bam, bam, bam. So the word that we're looking for is retractions. Retractions. You'll see it here. All right. You'll see it. It looks like it's dipping in each time they take a breath because they're struggling to breathe. So you'll be able to see their clavicles and everything else. Retractions. Does anybody did that did that uh jog anybody's memory? So an infant uh an infant has a proportionally large tongue and shorter, narrow, less stable airway. Alright, so because of that. They have a proportionally large tongue and shorter and narrower, narrower, less stable airway. So knowing that whenever we're in this action here of uh, BVMing that patient, in what position do we have their head in? Does anybody remember? Right, no tilt, we, but we call that something. We call it something. Just gave y'all a clue. Y'all could hear it. The sniffing position. So in the sniffing, so in order to maintain that sniffing position, uh, what do we generally do with, uh, with an infant or a neonate? What do we do to put them at that sniffing position? What's the easiest way to do it?
Well, it's it's not so much that the bag is big, it's that the baby is small. We don't put it behind their head. What do we put it? Where do we put it? Under their what? Under their shoulders. That's right. Sure, sure. So, awesome. So we put we put it underneath their shoulders, okay? Um, and that puts their head into a sniffing position. I don't have a small child in here, or I would show you. I actually do. I, mm, I do have a small child. I, I think I have a uh, CPR dummy somewhere. It's in the garage. I'm not going to worry with it today. We'll talk about it during patient assessment, maybe. Uh, so, yes, under the shoulders is where you're going to do that. And that's going to help. So you take, you fold it up, and then just make sure it's under the shoulders. Uh, I was trying to look for a straw. I don't have one. I would show you all something. Just to kind of give you an idea of... All right, so... We'll use this right quick. So a, a child, you know, this is huge for a child. But so you take that you take that child and you put them in that sniffing position, all right? So just think of this as, as the tube, the airway right here, okay? The airway. If you don't put them in that sniffing position and you do the head tilt chin lift, you take their, at that point, you're taking their airway and you're causing this. You're causing it to collapse in on itself, right? Which is going to close off the airway. It's going to pinch it. It'll pinch it right here because you're putting that in there, okay? All right. And that's how that happens. All right. <clears throat> so, uh... Airway is obstructed more easily, and in that because of that, in older children uh, than in, than it is in older children or adults. So in your infants, and this is a very real scenario that you see in this picture, right here, of having to do this. Um, it's a uh, it's it's never any fun, but you have to you know you gotta you gotta do it, and it is gonna happen if you're on a truck long enough. It you know you will get in this situation. You have to be the calmest person on that scene. Uh, for bag valve mass ventilation, like you see here, uh, remember that the infant's lungs are fragile. They're very small and it's fragile. It only takes about a mouthful, right? Too forceful of ventilations uh, can cause a uh, trauma from pressure. Or what do we call that type of trauma? Does anybody remember? When you blow out a lung? Barrow trauma, that's right. So barrow, meaning pressure, and uh, so the, it causes the barrow trauma. So there isn't a lot of air that comes out of that. That is a uh, pediatric bag there. It's not a full bag. It's a pediatric bag. So it's just one step. But it's like, a, it's like I was telling you all the other day. I used to only carry a pediatric bag in, uh, in my bag. So you can use that. But you're, you just got to be careful. All you're going to look for is chest rise and fall, right? You're looking for that chest rise and fall. All right, so neonates and infants, um, the nervous system. The nervous system continues to evolve after birth, you, you would hope. A uh, neonate's born with certain reflexes. Uh, a moral reflex, which is a startle reflex. If you've ever seen the video of the little baby sitting in the in the bouncy, in the bouncer, and uh, they they make a noise or something like that, and it you know makes a his face lights up and he acts surprised. So it's it's surprised uh, by something or someone. The uh, the neonate. Uh, opens his arms and real wide and spreads his fingers and seems to grab at things. All right, that's called a moro reflex. A palmer grasp occurs when an object is placed into a neonate's palm. So whenever you're sitting there and you're like uh, 
They're like, oh, look, he's holding my hand. You know, you know, oh, it's so cute. That's a reflex. So it's called Palmer Grasp. Uh, if you, it's, it's something that they have since they're underdeveloped. They have these type of reflexes that, that occur naturally. So if you put something in their palm, they're going to grab it. I, I, if, if it makes you feel good that, that they do it because they love you, then you can continue to believe it. <laughs> uh, the rooting reflex, another, re, another thing, is uh, it takes place when something touches a neonate's cheek. If it touches their cheek, the neonate will instinctively turn his or her head towards the touch. And you'll see them. You'll see them sometimes. They'll do the uh, thing, like, and people call that kiss. You know that? Oh, he's kissing me. Oh, he's he actually uh, he's actually looking for that that feeding is what they're looking for a lot of times, uh, which leads us to the sucking reflex. It's going to occur when an infant's lips are stroked on anything, and then uh, all those are those together. The sucking and the rooting reflex are often evident whenever they're feeding. All right, up next, we've talked about this before, uh, the fontanelles, or fontanelles. It allows the head to be molded, right? The fontanelles are the, are the area or space between the bones. Let's see here, here, here and here okay um i don't know if you can see that or not whenever i do that yep fontanelle 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 and fontanelle so uh <coughs> yeah the three or four bones of the skull that eventually uh, eventually bind together and form suture joints uh, in between those where you have your fontanelles. The posterior fontanelle normally fuses by three months of age, and then the anterior uh, fontanelle fuses between nine and 18 months of age. Uh, if either of the fontanelles is depressed, the infant's most likely dehydrated, if you remember that. If it's depressed in there... Uh, then it's dehydrated. If it's bulging, then that's indicative to increased uh, ICP or uh, intracranial pressure. So some sort of possible injury. So that's something that we're looking for when we're looking. Uh, we come upon a child, and you know we see that some sort of head injury, possibly shaking baby syndrome, uh, something to that effect. All right, the musculoskeletal system. So growth plates aid in the lengthening of bones. Uh, what is another word for the growth plate? Does anybody remember that from the human anatomy? They're located on either end of an infant's long bone, and uh, they aid in the length of bones. Yep, the epiphyseal plate. That's right. So whenever you give an I an IO, you don't you do not want you want to make sure that you do not uh, land your IO into the epiphyseal plate, because if you cause damage to that epiphyseal plate, you can actually cause damage to their growth. All right, up next, the renal system. Uh, infants can become dehydrated easily because of the kidneys, or because their kidneys are usually can't produce concentrated urine. Um, and infants' urine consists of mainly water, which can cause the development of electrolyte imbalances. That's why most of the time in infants, we don't feed them a lot of water, because if you feed them a lot of water, it can cause that electrolyte imbalance uh, to be off it even worse. We mostly stick with uh, mostly stick with the the milk or the formula or what have you, but not we try to stay away from giving them too much water. Um, their immune system, 
For the first six months of life, the immune system maintains some of the mother's immunities. Uh, so the infant has naturally acquired some passive immunities. Uh, infants can also receive antibodies via breastfeeding. Uh, further, That's going to further enhance their immune system. That kid is not happy. So uh, psychosocial changes. So that it begins at birth and evolves as the infant interacts with and reacts to the environment around it. Uh, changes occur during the first year of life, mostly. Crying is the main method of communicating distress for most infants. Parents can often tell... Yeah. Parents can often tell uh, what's wrong just by the tone of an infant's crying. You know, if it's distressed or uncomfortable or not happy or, you know, sc scared or what, what have you, based on the sound. So... One key to having a happy, healthy infant is spending time with the child. Um, bonding is uh, the formation of close personal relationship. It's uh, based on secure attachment. Secure attachment. So secure attachment occurs when an infant understands the parents or caregivers will be responsive to his or her needs. Okay. Uh, anxious avoidant attachment is found in infants who are repeatedly rejected. Okay? And then uh, infants show, they, they show little emotion or emotional response to their parents or caregivers and treat them as if they would any other stranger at that point. Uh, uh, separation anxiety is common in older infants. An infant may, exempt, uh, may exhibit the clingy behavior and fear of unfamiliar places and people. As the infants become accustomed to their homes and their families, they begin to need that security of a, of a, uh, a known environment or a predictable environment. So another thing is trust and mistrust. It refers to the stage of development from birth to about 18 months. Uh, most infants desire that their world be planned, organized, and routine. And then uh, when caregivers provide this, this uh, plan organized and routine, um, they meet that desire, then the infants gain trust in those people. If the infant doesn't perceive the environment as secure, uh, then they're going to develop a sense of mistrust. So toddlers, uh, one to three years, and preschoolers, three to six years. Okay. Uh, physical changes, toddlers, one to three years. Their pulse rate is 80 to 140 beats a minute. Uh, their respiratory rate is 22 to 37 breaths a minute. And their systolic blood pressure is 86 to 106 millimeters of mercury. Systolic, talk number, right? Uh, Average temperature is 96.8 to 99.6. Uh, usually levels out at 98.6 by preschool age. They're actually going in and saying that those numbers are changing. And now that everybody's been taking temperatures for a year, over a year. Uh, also, a toddler's lungs continue to develop uh, more terminal bronchioles and alveoli as well. So as discussed, the preschool preschooler's age is three to six years old. Uh, their pulse rate is between 65 to 120 beats a minute, respiratory rate 20 to 28 beats a minute. Uh, their systolic blood pressure is between 89 to 112 millimeters of mercury. And then their weight gain should just about level off. Uh, although toddlers and preschoolers have more lung tissue, 
Uh, they do not they do not have well developed lung musculature at this point, so this prevents them from sustaining deep or rapid respirations for an extended period of time, and that's why we say those youngins, those pediatrics, is that they will compensate, 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 compensate. They'll hold, 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 and then just whoosh, straight off the cliff. And uh, when they do, it's it's no good at that point. You're you are going to work your tail off. So, also with toddlers and preschoolers, the loss of passive immunity occurs during this stage. Uh, viral infections such as colds often develop that may manifest in uh, the GI uh, and GI distress or gastrointestinal distress or uh, the upper respiratory tract infections. So, uh, you know, URIs or what have you, you see them a lot. Uh, neuromuscular growth also makes considerable progress at this age. And toddlers and preschoolers spend a great deal of time finding out exactly how to use their nervous system and muscles by walking, running, jumping, and playing. Uh, by the end of this stage, though, preschoolers will have a brain that weighs 90% of its final adult weight. So that's, that's pretty wild. So it, it, preschoolers will have their brain will weigh 90% of its final adult weight. So if you're thinking about that, that means that your brain is only going to go 10 more percent as you grow. Which uh, that makes perfect sense because I still know adult I still know adults that uh, are at that ninety percentile still. It just hadn't kicked in yet. So uh, playing it it places stress on the muscles and bones and increases muscle and bone density. So the more they play, the healthier their bones and muscles are going to be. So get them out there, helicopter mom. Get them out there. Uh, continued develop, development of the renal system and elimination patterns are going to occur. And then psychologically, uh, toddlers have the neuromuscular control. It's capable of bladder control by 12 to 15 months of age. Should be. Should have. A child may not be psychologically ready until 18 to 30 months of age, though. And the average age for completion of toilet training is between 28 months of age or uh, is around 28 months of age. Twenty-eight months of age. That's funny. So also around this time, uh, teething occurs. If you've ever if you've ever been around a a toddler that teethes and it's it's very painful for them, and uh, sometimes it, a fever comes with it. The Also, with toddlers and preschoolers, the leading cause of death for this age group, what do you think the leading cause of death is for this age group? It doesn't have anything to do with teething. I can tell you that. Yep, accidents. Unintentional injuries. So psycho, uh, psychosocial changes. Toddlers or preschoolers continue to learn to speak and express themselves. Uh, however, toddlers are very attached to their parents and feel safe with them. Uh, separation anxiety peaks at around 10 to 18 months of age. At 36 months of age, basic language is mastered. Uh, refinement of the skill is continued throughout their childhood, hopefully. Uh, by age 3 or 4, most of your children use and understand full sentences by age 3 or 4. <coughs> so they go from using language to communicate what they want to using language to create it, to be creative and uh, and play as well. Inter so interaction and playing games with other children uh, begins also at this age. 
And te it teaches control and following rules and competitiveness uh, whenever they get to interact and play with other children. By 18 to 24 months, uh, toddlers usually begin to understand what cause and effect is. And then also uh, children learn to recognize sexual differences by observing their role models. So the people around them, people they look up to. And that's school-age children are going to be ages 6 to 12. School-age children, ages 6 to 12. Uh, the physical changes are going to be from 6 to 12. A school-age child's vital signs and, and body gradually approach those observed in, in adulthood. Uh, pulse rates approximately 58 to 118 beats a minute. Respiratory rate 18 to 25. And systolic blood pressure is 97 to 120 millimeters of mercury. Uh, some of the, in uh, school age children, some of the obvious physical traits uh, and changes in the body function become apparent. Um, most children grow about four pounds or two kilograms and two and a half inches or six centimeters. Uh, each year after this, most children. I I grew way more kilograms and way less centimeters. <laughs> uh, brain activity increases in both hemispheres, and then permanent teeth uh, begin to replace the their primary teeth or their baby teeth. And in this, in this age group, unintentional injuries are still the leading cause of death. Yeah, I do say. So, psychosocial changes uh, in school-age children. The critical time in development uh, where children learn various types of reasoning are at this point, so pre-conventional reasoning. reasoning. Uh, children act almost purely to avoid punishment. Yeah, oh my God, we're gonna do this now. Uh, children act almost purely to avoid punishment and, they, and to get what they want, so that's what they're doing. Um, conventional reasoning is the child will look for approval from peers and the rest of society. And post-conventional reasoning is the children make decisions guided by their conscience. So they start to develop that conscience. <laughs> At some point you lose it. Um, by comparing themselves with adults and their peers, children uh, begin to develop their self-concept and self-esteem. Also, self-concept is our perception of ourselves. Makes sense, right? Self-concept. Self-esteem is how we feel about ourselves and how we fit in with our peers. So, that is that. All right, so adolescence, the fun time. Adolescence, uh, that's going to be between 12 and 18 years of age. The physical changes, uh, your vital signs are going to begin to level off within the adult range. So pulse rate between 50 and 100, respiratory rate between 12 and 20, systolic blood pressure between 110 and 131 uh, millimeters of mercury. In adolescence, uh, they experience a rapid two to three year growth spurt, uh, big increase in uh, muscle and bone growth, and the body changes. Growth begins with the hands and feet, and then the long bones, or long bones, like long bones, like those. <laughs> uh, and then also, and then the growth of the torso is after that. Girls, uh, females generally finish growing by the age of 16. Boys continue until they're 18 years of age. Uh, muscle mass and bone density are, are nearly at all uh, at adult levels at that point. The reproductive system matures, so uh, secondary sexual development takes place. 
uh, external sex sex origin uh, sex organs enlarge. They actually start to get uh, pubic hair and axillary hair begin to appear. Uh, their voices start to change in range and depth. And in females, breast and thighs increase in size as adipose tissue is deposited. Adipose tissue is what type of tissue? That's just a nice way of saying what type of tissue. Fat tissue, that's right. <coughs> uh, menstruation usually begins during this time as well. You're too slow for what? Uh, by, the, by the middle of adolescence, boys are able to produce sperm and girls' ovaries start releasing eggs for fertilization. Um, acne can also occur uh, due to hormon hormonal changes. And then uh, also continuing on with the trend, unintentional injuries are also the leading cause, are still the leading cause of death for adolescents. So continuing with adolescence, psychosocial changes. Uh, adolescents and their families often deal with conflict as, um, as adolescents try to gain control of their life, their own lives. And, um, uh, and they try to get independence from their parents. Uh, privacy, privacy usually becomes an issue and self-consciousness increases. So like, uh, pri privacy, I know, uh, growing up and then also in our home here is like you you don't have privacy uh, for the most part you know it, until you start paying some bills you start paying some bills you'll get some privacy um adolescents uh, you, adolescents also struggle to create their own identity at this point also so they use feedback from their families and peers to help create their adult image so that's that's why you that's why they always talk about building building your children up building them up. Uh, they often want to be treated like adults, yet they want to be cared for like children. And then rebellious behavior from that can be a part of adolescents trying to find their own identity. I want to be led, but I only want to be led when I feel like I want to be led. I'm... I was a model child, my parents told me. A model of what? Uh, continuing on with uh, psychosocial changes. Uh, adolescents continually compare themselves with their peers, uh, which makes peer pressure a major factor in adolescent psychological growth. Yeah. Yeah. Antisocial behavior peaks during the eighth or ninth grade, and then uh, so that's when you get you start to venture into the eating disorders that may develop uh, as they become obsessed with their their body image or their self image, and then also self destructive behaviors such as smoking, drinking, sex, and other high risk behaviors may begin at this point. And that's all the point of trying to find that identity. You know, it defines me. They have to find out what defines them. So it's our job to make sure that we provide the environment uh, so that they can find what defines them. And hopefully the definition that we are portraying out there or trying to get out there is what they find defines them. Um, <clears throat> adolescents may grow a greater interest in sexual relations. No way. They make movies about it, crazy as it seems. And then also they, they develop a uh, code of personal ethics uh, based partly on their parents' ethics and values and partly on the influence of the adolescent's environment. Okay, so teenagers are at a higher risk than other populations also at this point for uh, suicide and depression because they have a lot going on there, right? So we have to pay attention. We have to pay attention to what's going on. Uh, we have to... We have to develop uh, our children, you know, in, in a manner that's stable for them. Uh, 
as a provider, let's say as a provider, a lot of times they just want to, you know, working with a lot of children like like I have in the past, a lot of times they just want to, they want you to listen to them, okay? Uh, they sit in this house, they sit in these houses or what have you, depending on whatever their environment is. And there's an article that go that I read the other day that hit hit this on the head. I mean, just nailed it. And so, uh, and it kind of goes along with what we're talking about. This, uh, apparently this 13-year-old girl um, was in this house, terrible home, uh, just uh, just real low income, uh, was sent there by another family member or sent there by another parent to this other home uh, to be raised by this other parent in a lower socioeconomic uh, area or state where there's a lot of crime, a lot of, you know, a lot of disarray in this child's life. Uh, and at this point in time, the the child, I guess, had been 13 years old now. The child had been kind of, you know, real indecisive and argumentative and everything else. And the parent decided that they would call the police because they can't handle their child. Which, if you have to call the police to handle your child, you, you, and the child is not doing anything crazy, it's not wrecking anything or threatening you or anything else, you just can't get them to listen, or they're arguing with you. I don't know if I should. Fool, I don't know if I should give opinion out on that. How I think that should be handled, but then you have an issue if you can't handle your own child. Um. So anyway, this medic talks about getting on scene. It was very relatable, uh, and the mom's going on and on about something's wrong with her and they want to get her a mental evaluation. They want this child to get mentally evaluated on and find out what is in what's wrong with this child's head. What's the deal with this child's head? What's what's talking out of her head? She's gone crazy, everything else. So this medic uh gets the child into the ambulance and puts his paperwork down and everything just kind of relaxing and uh the child is just, you can see the child's got this uh, nervousness, this, this it's kind of a little bit of angst. And uh, he says uh, he says something very simple. He said, you know, instead of asking the child, what's wrong with you? He asked the child, what is wrong with all those people? What's wrong with all those people? Okay, because that's the child's environment that they're in. And at that point, the child was able to open up and become relaxed and all the child wanted was to be listened to and all the child wanted was for somebody stable to speak with or to convey the feelings to and uh come to find out that she you know she didn't think that her parents wanted her um they the other parent won't allow her back at the other house because uh, the other children and everything else they they don't want to do it shove it off on somebody else so on and so forth and this is what and this is what a child deals with on a daily basis no matter what uh no matter what situation they're in what environment they're in this always goes through a child's head on a constant basis uh so you have to you have to relate with that child you have to be able to convey those feelings with that child more importantly sometimes it's better to it's it's better to listen than to provide advice all the time. Uh, in our positions, it's really hard to relate to our children in the fact because we always want to help. We have what's called the the hero complex or hero syndrome where somebody gives you a problem or somebody tells you something and you feel like you have to solve it. You feel like you have to help. And you're not doing it with ill intention. You're doing it with uh, you're doing it because you want to help. That's all you want to that's all you want to do is help. This works with this works with adults too. Also, uh, I had to learn this the hard way going in, but uh, sometimes you just need to listen. Just listen and pay attention. Sometimes it doesn't re it doesn't require you to give feedback uh, to be able to get your point across. So, or to be able to listen or to be able to help. Sometimes feedback isn't needed. Sorry, I'm reading. I'm 
I'm sorry to hear that. And I'm also I'm 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 very happy to see that you are succeeding. Uh, that you're doing you're doing great now. And I, so you could probably attest to uh, a lot of times it's the listening. You know, just somebody to listen to you uh, that really helps out a lot. I speak at this at nauseum because that you know my major uh, my major at USM or one or my minor sorry my minor at USM was a uh, was a uh, psychology and more of abnormal psychology and adolescent psychology. Yeah, it's a you know it's it's one of those things that you, sometimes the the listening you know just listening to someone helps out tremendously. I've had many of I've had many of kids in my ambulance and also on calls that I've been to that are in the same situation. Uh, they're not same, it's not the same, it's the same, it's the same like uh, subject, same subject or you know what have you, it's not the same deal every time. It's always a different, it's always a different situation, finite details, always different details, but it's close to the same realm of what's going on. And so uh, and I talk about uh, I talk about teenage and child suicide. Uh, it's really close to my heart because that's uh, that's something that I've you know I've never dealt with it personally in the fact of myself, but I've dealt with it through family members and I've dealt with it through uh, also through work. And it's it's something that you are going to be a integral part of that of that child's life at the time you get that call. Because your your job involves with sick and dying, you know, or you're all you're called when somebody's having a bad day. It's always that person's worst worst day uh, at the point that you're to show up. Your your sympathy or your empathy could be what changes that child or ch- what changes the, even that adult. Uh, your willingness to listen and not pass it off as you're just a kid. You don't have enough life experience to be feeling like this or to be acting like this. That's not going to help anything out. It's not even going to help you out. Um, you didn't like it. You still don't like it when somebody says you don't have the experience. Uh, you want the experience. You just want somebody to listen to you and to be able to convey that. Let them convey that. So it helps out a lot if you can relate and build that rapport. It's also going to keep them calm. I've had a, I had a female get in my ambulance one time, um, and and by the way, if you ever have stories, uh, that's a that's a very good one. That's a very good one, Leanne. If you if you ever have stories, don't fear you know putting it out there. Or if you want to speak, say so. Um, and then also, if it's about, let's go ahead and discuss this. If you ever want to speak about a patient, okay, we don't say anything that's PHI, PHI right? Uh, since it is for educational purposes, we can speak about patients, but we have to take about names. Uh, we have to take, a, you know, usually if you change the ages, uh, that helps too. Places, you really don't want to get finite with the place, you know, a lot of details. You want to keep that uh, patient information for the most part out of it, and uh, you can talk about it. You know, you can talk about the uh, incident or you can talk about that call or what have you, just so long as it can't be readily um, tied to a certain scene call person or anything like that that can be recognized, then you can talk about it. So uh, anyway, so I had I had this child. She was probably around 15, 16 years old. Uh, got called there. Mom was losing her mind about her. Said that she tired, she can't deal with her no more. She's done with it. Child gets in the ambulance. And so I'm, I'm talking to her. I ask, I said, "Hey, what's, what's going on? What's, uh, what's going on today?" Tell me. And she's, and she says, "Nothing's wrong with me." I said, "Well, something's wrong with you. You're here in the ambulance. Um, you willingly got into the ambulance. Uh, why would you get into the ambulance? What is, what today? What is it about today that makes it different from any other day?" And she starts hyperventilating. And of course, I, I told her, I said, listen, you have got to, you've got to regulate your breathing. I said, the reason why you have to regulate your breathing, because if you start hyperventilating, you're going to pass out. And if you pass out, I got to put a tube in your throat and you're not going to like that because you're going to come back and you're going to be very panicked when that happens. And I was like, so just talk to me. Let's talk about it. Let's, 
let's calm down. And she went on to this whole story about how her boyfriend had broke up with her and how this all had cheated. And, I mean, she was putting names in there. Uh, he went out with Becky and Becky blah, 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 and so on and so forth. And this was about a 25-minute ride, and I listened the entire time. I just sat there and listened. And shook my head and, you know, provided small amounts of feedback. And uh, by the time we got to the hospital, her vitals had went, you know, had went down. She was back at normal status. And uh, what was crazy is that as soon as the ambulance doors open, who do you think's waiting right there to start it up again? Or to create more of that? And I hadn't even got her off the monitor yet, so it was interesting to see. Mom. No, Mom. Security... I don't I don't call security unless I need to, but yes, mom was sitting right there. And of course mom's like, We we going inside and I I hadn't even taken her off the monitor yet and I could already see it right back up. So I told mom, I said, Hey mom, I need you to go to the uh I need you to go to the waiting room and we'll come back or somebody will come back and speak to you. Please go to the waiting room. And I sent her away. And uh because I didn't need her. I didn't I didn't need her at that time. And load it up. Start, everything started normalized back down. Brought her inside. Uh, talked to the nurses, and I actually had to let the nurse know because we get calloused after a while. Um, workers, you know, working in the hospital so much, seeing this over and over, we get calloused. So I just let them know, hey, this is the issue that's going on. She did start hyperventilating, and uh, when this happened, we were able to talk her out of it. Um, she may, she may want to go get a psyche valve just to make sure she doesn't plan on hurting herself or anybody else. Uh, but it, just take it from that account that we want to, you know, just be smooth with her and she'll and she'll listen, or she just be smooth with her and she'll stay calm. And then, you know, it, after I left, I, I don't know. It depends on the nurse that came out there that helped her out or not. But uh, long story short. That's how you know you have to you have to have some sort of empathy. You have to build a rapport with that patient. You don't know these people from Adam most of the time. Hopefully, you don't know these people from Adam. Uh, but you have to. You don't know them, but you have to know them, and you have to be able to relate. And that's how you're going to help that child or that teenager out in that very that very big issue. And uh, the fact that you're willing to step out there. And not be a, and not be just a medical professional, but to be a friend as well. Uh, you may turn around, uh, you may turn that child's belief around, or you may turn that child's thought process around at that point, and you may save them. So uh, just think about that next time you have one of those patients, and you will, you will have those patients, and then you'll also come across those patients that that succeed in their suicide attempts, and uh, and you'll have to deal with that as well. And uh, when you do, you just have to take it as a learning experience. Take it as a learning experience. Don't take it as a, a, just another body. Uh, take it as a, a young person lost their life needlessly due to, you know, what have you. So, always think about it. All right. Sorry about that. Get on my soapbox. Moving on. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Leanne, for that story. That was great. We are definitely glad to have you here. And that's my rant. Yep, that's my rant. So, uh, up next, early adults, age 19 to 40. I don't know if uh, 40 is considered an early adult. <laughs> so, whatever. <laughs> early adults range in age 19 to 40. That's a, that's a long one. Uh, vital signs they do not uh, they uh, do not vary greatly uh, from those that we saw uh, that we've seen through the rest of adulthood or through you know the teenage years what have you. Ideally, your pulse rate will stay around seventy beats a minute, uh, depending on what your what your lifestyle is like. That really helps out a lot. My my pulse rate usually stays between fifty four and sixty usually. Um, so it's, it's not unusual to have something lower. Uh, respiratory rate, uh, will stay around 12 to 20. And, uh, systolic blood pressure will be approximately between 90 to 140 millimeters of mercury. 
sometimes better than others. Uh, I've had my blood pressure all the way up to 185 over 118 before. Uh, given there are certain people who can get my blood pressure boiling every now and then. So from 19 to 25 years of age, uh, the body should be functioning at its optimal level. Optimal level. Did you raise your hand? What's up? Is that what a hand raise looks like? Go ahead, Ty. You had a question? Oh, okay. All right. Anyway, back to it. Um, so this is where your lifelong habits and routines begin to develop. Uh, at the beginning, oh, okay. Um, at the beginning of this period, the body is working at peak efficiency. Should be uh, nineteen to twenty-five. It definitely should be. And uh, but as early adulthood continues, wear and tear on your bones can can uh, can happen, and changes in body and body tissues and muscle can also begin. And then. Uh, <clears throat> Also, uh, disc in the spine begin to settle, and height sometimes shrinks at that point. Uh, fatty tissue increases, which leads to weight gain. No way. And uh, muscle strength decreases as well. And uh, reflexes are pretty slow. Unintentional injury is still the leading cause of death in this age group also. Psychosocial changes, uh, life centers on work, families, and stress. Uh, then during this period, humans strive to create a place for themselves. You're not trying to find your place in this world. Now you're trying to create a place for yourself in the world. And many do everything they can to settle down. So you're trying to settle down at this point. As, er as early adults struggle to find stability in their careers, job stress becomes high. Absolutely. Uh, along with the a tendency to settle down, it often becomes, uh, th there comes, you know, marriage and a family as well. Uh, childbirth is common in this age group. It's the most common in this age group. So despite all of this uh, stress and change, this is one of the more stable periods of life. Uh, generally, fewer psychological problems uh, related to well-being happen at this point. All right. We're going to take a 10-minute break right there. Is anybody opposed to that? So we're going to take a 10 minute break. We'll be back in 10 minutes.
I don't know how much longer we have left. I guess I somehow when I was leaving, I hit the button or something and paused it on accident. So I don't know if we're in deficit or if I still got a few or a minute or two left. Not sure. There was something I was wanting to look up. I forgot what it was. Man, I'm just scattering today. All right, is everybody back yet? Did I overextend? Did I underextend? Well, hello. Plan. Here. Gotcha. Alrighty. We will dive right back in. went out there it's the first break I go out there and there was nothing to eat so you know I'm back here again empty-handed empty-bellied I guess it's fin for yourself night This guy. <laughs> it looks like his Plenty of Fish profile picture. That guy right there. Does anybody use Plenty of Fish anymore? Or does anybody ever use that? I've heard of it. Never used it. I remember it was pretty hot and heavy. Tinder. Tinder is what everybody uses now, I guess. Single people, well, most single people. <laughs> no, absolutely not. I'm definitely happy with the one that I got. Mm, I didn't find her at Plenty of Fish or Tinder or anything like that. I actually, I actually met her and spoke to her and we were friends for seven years before we went out on our first date friends for seven years and that was it it's a pretty interesting story I finally realized that she should probably be my girlfriend I was in uh, I was in Afghanistan and we had been chatting back and forth so much and I'd always said, and I had always said, uh, no, she did not drive a Volkswagen. Nope, no, that is a different one. 
Oh my goodness. So when I, so anyway, um, whenever we, whenever I was in Afghanistan, we actually took and I was, uh, I was like, man, if I, if I get back home, I would, you know, I would date somebody like my, like my friend Melinda and, uh, somebody that one of my friends that was there was like, well, why don't you just date Melinda? And I was like, ah, I can't do that. She's a good friend of mine. I wouldn't want to ruin it. And yeah, please. <laughs> I know who you're referring to though. And, uh, so, uh, oof. so anyway, I, he's like, why don't you just date your friend Melinda? And I was like, no, nah, I don't want to ruin it because that's, you know, that's what I was pretty well known for back then. And then the more I thought about it, the more I wanted to do that. And so got back home and, uh, I, when I got back home, I actually contacted her and I said, Hey, let's, uh, I said, let's meet up. And of course she's like, yeah, we'll meet up. We're, you know, we've been friends for years. And so, uh, we met up and that's what I considered my first date. Uh, so she doesn't, she most definitely does not. Uh, I did though. I was like, when, whenever I got back home, that was the only person that I wanted to be with at the time. And she was still, you know, she was still single and doing her thing and everything else. So I, uh, you know, I told her, I was like, do your thing. You know, whenever you, you know, whenever you get tired of dating all these doofuses, uh, then come on back. I'll be here probably fishing. Cause that's what I did every single day. And so, uh, yep. <laughs> No, no, no trouble at all. That is the X. That was the X that you're referring to as the X. All right, moving on. So, uh, middle adults, ages 41 to 60. I really don't feel like 41 is... is the middle but but we'll take it we'll i will definitely take it i'll still consider myself a young early adult and i'll feel good about it so age 41 to 60 uh vital signs are the same as early adult adults uh average pulse rate 70 beats a minute respiratory 12 to 20 systolic 90 to 140 right uh the body still functioning at a high level but middle adults are vulnerable to vision and hearing loss uh with other varying degrees of degradation throughout the body uh, cardiovascular health becomes an issue in many people. Okay. So your cancer or cancer does in the incidence of cancer can increase uh, during this point in time. I was always told by a uh, by a friend of mine uh, in the medical field that if you live long enough, you will get cancer if you live long enough. So, uh, you know, waiting on that. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully that'll occur after my, my checks start coming in. Um, middle adults may begin having medical problems uh, and symptoms or be unaware of conditions such as diabetes and hypertension. Uh, that's why it's very important to get regular checkups. Uh, menopause. Uh, takes place in the late 40s to the early 50s. Uh, exercise and healthy diet can diminish many of the effects of aging. So you got that. Exercise and healthy diet can help you out. I need to get back into that. Unintentional injuries are the, still the leading cause of death of people aged 41 to 44 years of age. For ages 45 to 60, now the leading cause of death is cancer. That's crazy. That's crazy to even think about that the leading cause of death between the ages of 45 to 60 or whichever uh, is cancer. Cancer. So, uh, in knowing that, you know, um, you should definitely look at lifestyle changes, dietary changes. So uh, psychosocial changes, uh, focus is on achieving life goals. Makes sense, right? Uh, middle adults, uh, 
must readjust their lifestyle as children leave home, get that empty nest syndrome, right? And then finances become a, a worrisome issue at that point in time too. You're nearing, you know, you're nearing the end of that time where you can, you have the ability to work, you're getting that retirement time. Um, am I going to be able to support myself and my family or what have you during this time? So generally people at this age have uh, physical, emotional, and spiritual reserves to, uh, to handle life issues, to handle all of life's issues. <clears throat> uh, middle adults also uh, may find themselves caring for children, leaving for college, and caring for their aging, aging parents as well. So you have those stressors that could be in your life as a middle adult also. That's what I should have got. I should have got another coffee. I love, I love my coffee. Uh, and my bourbon, but we won't get into the bourbon. According to the CDC, uh, unintentional injury and accidents, the leading cause of death for toddlers, preschoolers, school age children, adolescents, early adults, and middle uh, middle adults, 41 to 44, for ages 45 to 60, leading cause of death is cancer, heart disease. Cancer are the leading causes of death in ages 65 and older. Heart disease and cancer are the leading causes of death in 65 and older. That was a depressing slide. But there you go. Older adults. She looks like she can whip up a mean tiramisu. I like tiramisu. That's the only reason I said that. That and uh, New York cheesecake. As you can tell, love my New York cheesecake. Uh, so older adults, 61 years of age and older. Older adults continue, uh, or I'm sorry, older adults include people 61 or older. The physical changes that come with this uh, your life expectancy is constantly changing at this point. Uh, now, approximately 78 years with a maximum life expectancy estimate, estimated at 120 years. 120 years. I couldn't imagine being on this earth for 120 years. Um, age, uh, age to which a person will live is based mainly on many factors like uh, the year of birth and country in which a person lives. Can uh can base that as well. Uh, da, 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 da. Heart disease and cancer, as we said in a depressing slide just a little while ago, uh, are the leading causes of death in ages 65 to and older. Your vital signs depends on on the patient. Um, the, it depends on their overall health, their medical conditions, and their medications taken. So that's, that's why it's important when we're doing our patient assessments, which is the next chapter, by the way, uh, that we write all that down, right? Older adults are often able to overcome numerous medical problems. So um, they may need multiple medications to do so, uh, but they do overcome a lot of those issues. So in... Older adults, um, cardiovascular system, the cardiac function declines with age, largely due to atherosclerosis. What is atherosclerosis? I think we touched on this in a past chapter. Atherosclerosis. Somebody quickly, let's break it down. Hardening of the arteries. There you go, Leanne. Um, cholesterol and calcium buildup. Inside, uh, what are you texting with, Ty? Good Lord. Uh, cardiac function declines. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, cholesterol and calcium buildup inside the walls of blood vessels are forming plaque. Uh, the accumulation of plaque eventually leads to partial or complete blockage or flow from there. And then a uh, majority of people older than 65 have some degree of arthrosclerotic disease. Your tablet. 
uh, heart rate and cardiac output decrease. Uh, I, I always always ask that kind of thing if they have medical if they have papers or anything or their cardiac patients. I always uh, get into that. Cardiac output can no it can no longer meet the demands of the body, so it becomes issues. Uh, the vascular system becomes stiff. So diastolic, uh, so it, because of that, your diastolic blood pressure increases with age, and because of the the wearing of of the uh, of the vascular system, and the heart must work harder to move blood effectively. <laughs> the blood flow to the organs is is also reduced, which causes issues as well. The uh, the ability to produce replacement blood cells declines, as does the blood volume. Uh, bone marrow is, re is replaced with fatty tissue at this point, unfortunately. So in the respiratory system, the size of an airway increases as smooth muscles weaken, uh, start to relax and weaken out, right? It's getting stretched out. And uh, surface area of the alveoli decreases as well. Uh, the natural elasticity of the lungs will also decrease. We just talked about that. It starts to wear out, right? Uh, the intercostal muscles are used more to breathe. And then the chest becomes more rigid due to calcification of the ribs uh, to the sternum. So not as much movement going on, right? And then... Uh, Overall strength of the intercostal muscle and diaphragm decreases as it starts to go down. That's it's so important to make sure that you you keep up healthy habits as you go through. And then because of all of this, your breathing becomes more labor, labor intensive to do. Your chest becomes uh, more fragile and your bone structure weakens. Uh, bones are easier to break. Um, changes in the respiratory system. Uh, they're often gradual, and they go unnoticed uh, until a severe or life-threatening condition occurs. And then, of course, uh, you're alarmed at that point. So within the nose and mouth, there's a gradual loss of the mechanisms that protect the upper airway. Um, and this leads to decreased ability to clear secretions as well as decreased uh, cough and gag reflexes as well. So just more obstruction there, right? <clears throat> uh, the number of cilia, the, the cilia that line the airways diminishes, resulting in less sensation or responsiveness when structure of the upper airway is innervated. And that's why, that, that's why the gag reflex and decreased coughing reflex occurs. Uh, aspiration, though, and the obstruction, like we said, becomes much more likely at that point. So as, as smooth muscles uh, of the lower airway weaken with age, strong inhalation can make the walls and the uh, airway collapse inward and cause inspiratory wheezing. Okay. So it's kind of like, uh, well, I'm not going to describe that if I, if I talk about that working on cars. So it's you no longer have that muscle to keep it to keep it uh, open, so if you've ever if you've ever taken a I don't know it's hard to describe if you ever taken a, a balloon or a a weak a weak straw and you suck in on it there's no muscle to it there's no rigidity to it so it'll collapse in on itself and so that causes issues that's mainly what that's saying uh, it may. That's and because of that, it's going to cause uh, low flow rates and air trapping in there. Uh, overall, decrease in the meta metabolic activity of the older body leads to an increased risk of uh, lung infections. A lot going on. By the age of 75 years, yep, rings are getting weak, right? That's right. By the age of 75 years, the vital capacity. Uh, may amount to only about 50% of the vital capacity noted in young adults, right? Uh, contributing factors of this are the loss of respiratory muscle mass, 
uh, increased stiffness of the thoracic cage and decreased surface area for the air, air exchange. And vital, vital, be, holy cow. I guess I didn't have enough water to drink while I was there. Maybe, maybe I did. So vital capacity decreases and residual volume increases with age. Uh, the stagnant air remain, remains in the alveoli and it hampers gas exchange at that point, uh, which can produce hypercarbia and acidosis. So hypercarbia. What is hypercarbia? Somebody break it down for me. Break it down like a fraction. What is carbia? Possibly referring to carbonic acid. <clears throat> so carbonic acid up, and that's what causes your acidosis. So the endocrine system, people tend to slow down, uh, slow down their physical activity, but tend not to decrease their food intake. Holy cow. I feel like an older adult now. I'm starting way too early. Uh, insulin production drops off and metabolism decreases with age. Uh, older adults are more prone to diabetes mellitus at this point because of this. Uh, changes in mental status may be a result of changes in blood glucose levels. And then reproductive system changes to some extent. Uh, men are able to produce sperm long into their 80s, but the, the rigidity of the penis tends to decrease over time. So you talk about ED, things like that. Uh, women have a decrease in size of their uterus and, and vagina, and hormone production for both sexes gradually decreases as they age. Uh, sexual desire may diminish with age, but it doesn't cease. That's great. Next, uh, renal and gastrointestinal system, or GI system. Uh, filtration function declines by about 50% from ages 20 to 90 years of age. Uh, kidney mass decreases 20% decreases over the same span, 20 to 90. Uh, the nephrons, nephrons are their sophisticated capillaries that form uh, that perform filtering in the kidney. Number of nef the number of nephrons declines between ages thirty uh, and eighty years. So number that number of nephrons declines. Time to go to bed. Uh, so you also have a decreased ability to clear waste from the body and decreased ability to uh, to conserve fluids when they're when needed. And then changes in gastric and intestinal function may inhibit nutritional intake <coughs> and utilization in older adults as well. So this results in vitamin and mineral deficiencies because of this. Also, taste bud sensitivity decreases. So the sense of smell can be diminished. Um, I've been diminished since 2011. I haven't been able to smell much at all. And uh, with decreased taste, uh, response can diminish the flavor of food as well. 
That's why it's always so bland. The teeth become weaker, making it more difficult to chew certain types of foods. And then saliva secretion decreases. Saliva secretion decreases, uh, which reduces the body ability to process complex carbohydrates also. Uh, gastric motility slows uh, with age because of the loss of intestinal tract uh, neurons. So this can lead to feeling constipated or not hungry. The uh, Your gastric acid secretion diminishes. Uh, blood flow in the uh, mesenteric vessels may drop as much as 50%. 50%. And this, that decreases the ability uh, of the intestines to extract nutrients from digested food. Uh, gallstones become increasingly common. And then you also have anal sphincter uh, changes that reduce the elasticity and can produce fecal incontinence at that point. We end up back in diapers. The uh, nervous system, the brain weight may decrease from 10 to 20 percent by age 80. 10 to 20 percent. Uh, motor and sensory neural networks become slower and less responsive at that point. The metabolic rate in the older brain does not change and uh, oxygen consumption remains constant throughout. So some good news there, right? Uh, you do, though, have a diminished number of brain cells. Lord knows I can't, I can't, I don't need to lose any more than I already have. Uh, the interconnections in the brain cells continue as people age, uh, and this provides redundancy with the brain. Uh, you also have a loss of neurons, but not a loss of knowledge or skill. So you forget a lot of things. What's that old saying? I've forgotten more than you've learned. Uh, and then also your sleep patterns change. You wake up at 4 and you go to bed at 7. Seems pretty nice. So continuing on with the nervous system of your older adults. The uh, age-related shrinkage, shrinkage creates a void between the brain and the outermost layer of the meninges, uh, which provides room for the brain to move when stressed out. As you can see here. Uh, peripheral nerve sensation is diminished and uh, oftentimes misinterpreted as well. And then uh, you have slower reaction times, uh, cause longer delays between stimulation and motion. <clears throat> the slowdown in your reflexes decreases your uh, your sense to contribute the incident, uh, contributes incident of falls and trauma. So a lot of times you have falls and trauma because of the slowdown of reflexes. Uh, the nerve endings deteriorate. And the, ab the ability to, of the body to skin to sense the surroundings becomes hindered at that point. Um, we had, I've seen it in several patients. Had, had a patient that, you know, had her foot fall asleep. And uh, when she, and she was sitting in a chair, and when she stood up, her, her foot went to the side of her leg and the bone was sticking out of the ankle. She had bone sticking out of her ankle. And she walked around the house like that. I I came into the house and saw these red, these perfect red circles in a circle around the living room and then led all the way back to her bedroom. And uh was like, what is going on? And saw her, she was laying in the bed, and I said, I looked, I looked at her foot, Saw her foot to the side with the bone sticking out. I said, uh, ma'am, are you okay? She said, well, my foot's not on. <laughs> and I said, well, you're right about that, somewhat. Said, uh, maybe they can get that fixed up for you. So uh, we gave her some gave her some narcotics to ease the pain, which she, she didn't really complain about the pain much until we started to move her. 
and that's when we had to pay him. We had to scoop stretcher out. So uh, I've had that, and then in um, it, one place I was at, we had an issue where a couple, an older couple, were backing out of a driveway, and uh, the lady had gotten into the car, and she sat down in the passenger seat. The husband backed out of the driveway, and the lady said, stop, stop, stop. You know, just call him as could be. She said, need to call the ambulance. So he stopped, he looked, and her foot was off. Her foot had, her foot was laying in the floorboard. And uh, so we, uh, we, the ambulance, or, you know, fire department shows up, ambulance show up. We get over there, and she, all she can say, she says, my leg hurts. My, it, it hurts. You know, she's not screaming, she's not panicked, or anything. she just said it, it hurts. Uh, what had happened was when she got into the car, her foot was tangled up in a dog uh, in a dog wire rope and it when she closed the car door of course it the wire rope was wrapped around her foot and then on the outside of the door whenever he backed up it tightened up and just said shoop and took her foot off and uh when we got there she was just she said it hurts um she was like i'm sorry you know and i mean they cut it clean off so there wasn't a lot of bleeding or anything else um, she was like, I'm sorry for causing this much trouble. She was just as calm as could be. And I was like, nope, nope, nope. This, this is, uh, this is perfectly fine. Was, we can take it. But it's, things like that happen. So, uh, sensory changes. Most older adults, uh, can see and hear well. Uh, some may need eyeglasses or hearing aids. Uh, don't assume that older parents are deaf and blind automatically. Uh, by screaming at them or what have you, my granddad, would he'd probably cuss you out if you started that. Uh, pupillary reaction and ocular movements become more restricted with age so that your pupils are generally smaller and the uh, op opacity or the opacity... <laughs> of the uh, of the eye lens diminishes and so this diminishes your visual acuity and it makes the uh, pupil sluggish when responding to light so that's something to think about when you're doing your checks all right just remember you need to keep that age you need to keep that age in your thoughts when you're doing that uh and you're doing your checks they're sluggish because they're 80 90 years old maybe so uh, just make sure you're doing that, but also make sure you're doing those NARC counts and everything else, whatever drugs they've been taking. Um, visual, uh, uh, visual distortions are, are common at this point. And uh, also, uh, going back to what was said, hearing loss is four times more common than uh, vision loss. This thing still see you. So psychosocial changes, as uh, as older adult populations continue to grow, uh, we have the responsibility to accommodate their needs during their last 20 to 40 years of life. <clears throat> the increasing number of older adults in the U.S. as a result of the baby boom in the 1940s through the 1960s has reduced a need for more assisted living facilities, uh, skilled nursing facilities, uh, but also the financial limits may restrict access to the health care medications along with it. Uh, according to the U.S. government, 10% of people age 65 and older, which is approximately 4.5 million people, uh, were below the poverty level in 2014. 10%, 4.5 million people. So older adults share a great amount of wisdom with us, we'll say. Uh, we need to remind them of their self-worth. So just like we we don't need to push them to the side, remind them of self-worth when you're talking to them, uh, that's an adult sitting across from you, okay? That's somebody's family member. Uh, they lived a lot more and experienced a lot more than, than you may have. So until about five years before death, most late-stage adults retain high brain function so it's very important to you have to build the same rapport have the same conversations 
Uh, in the five years preceding death, mental function, uh, mental function is presumed to decline, and a theory refer to referred to as the uh, terminal drop hypothesis. So, if you ever get a chance to look that up, terminal drop hypothesis. Uh, one of the one of the one of the important issues that older adults need to face is mortality. Older adults may feel useless. Uh, or worry about being a burden to their families at this point. And then isolation and depression are also challenges with that. Look at that. End of the slideshow. All right, so does anybody have any questions about what we've talked about here today? Hold on, I'm trying to move my stuff around. Or about the test or anything else coming up? You're good? remember what the uh, password is for chapter 9 quiz so there is no password for the uh, for the module test I'm looking it up I'm looking it up The thing we voted on earlier, what was that again? Just to make sure I'm on the same page. Um, so, in patient assessment, which is the next chapter, um, I'm not, it's for the discussion for uh, the next chapter. Doesn't have anything to do with right now. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't even worry about it because uh, I've already chosen which one I'm going to pick. It'll be a discussion question. <laughs> uh, does anybody have any questions about the upcoming test or anything like that? You can study. Well, a little bit you can study. You can study using the your past tests. Um, they're they're open and able. You're able to look at them. So please take a look at them. Uh, don't forget, module test closes out in 72 hours, and this quiz. Uh, this quiz for chapter 9 will close out in 48 hours. So don't forget, 48-ish hours, apparently, uh, from the past we've seen. So I'm not going to keep y'all too long uh, because I know y'all have studying to do in order to uh, pass that test. Uh, it is The module test is 50 questions, and it's uh, 51 minutes. So it's going to be tight, but... You should be able to blow through it if you did your studying and uh, do very well. Okay. Yes. It does. All right, right quick. Uh, I'm going to give out the the code for today's class the code is 8312 8312 okay and that should be the code to open it up is there anything else anybody wants to discuss
module and chapter test. That's right. The test will not have a code. They're both due Friday. No. So, um, the quiz, chapter 9 quiz, 48 hours. Module test, 72 hours. Don't forget your, uh, if, if you made on any of the tests, if you made below a 75, then uh, you, owe me a, you owe me a report or an overview with emphasis on the questions you missed. So we can get it on. We, we, talked about, uh, we talked about earlier. Those are very important because if I don't get, uh, if I don't get the paper, then you make whatever um, I don't know, but if you don't, if I don't get the paper, then whatever test or whatever your score you made, that's what you keep. Uh, if you do turn in the paper, I and it's a good paper. Make sure that it's good. It looks good. It reads well. Um, I, I don't particularly care why you didn't do well on the test. I more care that you you write you write about the emphasis on the overview of the question you got wrong. I don't I don't want to say, hey, I, I missed this one because I just wasn't paying attention, blah, blah, blah. Just talk about the question, you know, and let me, or tell me that you understand that you got it. So just make sure you turn it. Also, uh, the D50 question. I uh, saw I only had five. Uh, so probably. So I, I, I saw that there was only five. So let's make sure we turn those in Friday, right? And if you ever have a question about when a test closes, you can see it. It tells you exactly when it closes. Uh, it also tells you, it also, if you look on the calendar, it lets you know close dates too. So if you look on the calendar, that calendar is very important. That's where I post the recorded classes. That's where I post all that. Yes, yes, you can still do the D50. There is no discussion on chapter nine because y'all have a module test and everything else. So, uh, most definitely, yeah, y'all have a y'all have a module test and y'all have a quiz test or a quiz. So I'm not going to put a discussion up for chapter nine. And that's why I, that's why I didn't put one up for chapter eight either because y'all have enough to study right now. Or did I? Just the D50. That's it. The D50. Okay. Any more questions from there? Don't forget, uh, 8312 is your code. And I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.